what's up guys Nick the informative fisherman here and today I want to talk about the essential cast to bass fishing uh, this is something I see often overlooked but I think could really help a beginner or an intermediate level guy maybe a few of you advanced guys out there might be able to pick up on a few subtle things here and there that I might be able to put across today the cast I'm talking about are your flip your pitch your roll cast your load cast your crankbait cast, your overhand rotating turn cast, and your skip. These are all casts you need to have. There's a couple that are very difficult, like pitching, if you don't know from the beginning, can be a little bit difficult to get used to, but we're gonna go over that. And skipping can be much more on the advanced end. But if you were able to skip in the summertime, the spring and the fall, when those fish move way back up under cover, you're going to catch more bass than the next guy. So let's get started. All right, so first off, if you don't know how to use a bait casting reel, skip skip over this part real quick and jump to my how to use a bait casting reel first and then come back to these it's going to make it a whole lot easier if you don't know how to use it first things first we're going to go over a lot of people see this motion okay a big whipping sidearm cast and bass fishing is hardly ever used i don't even consider it one of the casts to use what i consider one of the casts to use is roll cast i like to start off with my bait four to six inches dangling from the tip of my rod I'm going to click down my clutch and hold my thumb on the spool. I'm going to use the rod tip and move it around to develop momentum. You'll feel the pressure of that lure with that centrifugal force pulling around in a circle. As it starts to come around, I'm going to release it out there at that point. That's your roll cast. The roll cast is very, very beneficial for casting, you know, over 35 feet to a long range. If you're trying to go for really long range, we're going to go with that overhand cast. Uh, but your roll cast is basically longer than your pitching and flipping range, but to be accurate at the same time. Pull it down, pop my clutch down, get that momentum, and I'm going to do it one time just to show you real quick. That's that roll cast out there. One of the extra beneficial things to this too is instead of whipping it back and whipping it forward, I'm taking my eyes off of the lure. What happens with a roll cast, you can see the trajectory of your bait the whole time. For example, I'm going to make a roll cast. I see the bait out of the corner of my eye. The bait stays low to the water. I see where that bait is going to land. Therefore, if it's going too high into a tree or if I'm overcasting my target into a snag, I can stop it all of a sudden with the spool. So that's an advantage instead of bombing it overhand or taking it out of sight, over accelerating it to your target. Instead of that roll cast, you have that nice simple momentum. There's one critical thing to a roll cast that not a lot of people do. Not even a lot of advanced guys do this. They're going to make the cast as it's in the air. I'm going to ease my thumb back down onto the spool before my lure lands in the water and I'm going to ease the entry. I'm basically casting my lure and here's the water. Here's the water. As I'm casting my lure, I'm placing my thumb back on the spool. I'm raising my rod tip, kind of catching it, slowing the bait in midair, and then kind of easing it in. What that's going to do, it's going to lessen the splash. Let's say you're casting 35, 40 feet out to a fish in two foot of water. You know, he's up there. You don't want to spook him. If I let that bait come in at full speed and hit, more than likely I'm going to spook that fish. If I didn't, hey, I got lucky. I got an extra bite. But if I ease the descent and ease the entry instead of a splash, I got that whoop. That's going to get their attention. It's going to look more natural of something falling back into the water, a crawdad coming off a rock, a bluegill uh, getting smacked up against the surface, or a frog hopping in. It's going to look more natural. It's going to be quieter, more stealthy. It's not going to spook the fish. It's going to get the fish's attention and therefore lead to more bites. So I'm going to show you that over my shoulder. So I'm going to do that roll cast, and I want you to see before it lands. I'm going to ease it in. I'm going to catch it with my thumb and ease it in. I'm basically trying to just slow the entry of that lure down. Ease it in. You see that? How that was a lot quieter than the first one? Not only was it lower to the water, where you like that roll cast to be low, but I'm catching it and I'm easing it in. If I just let it plop, it's going to be much louder. Bonk. Like that. Bigger splash. More spooky. Versus... Making that roll cast, catching it, easing it in. About half the splash, half is noisy, therefore going to lead to more strikes. That's your roll cast. 
So now I want to talk about flipping and pitching. I have an extensive video for this on how to do it to break it inside and out. In case you're having trouble from this one, watch my how to flip and pitch video. More common in bass fishing nowadays, we're doing more pitching than we are flipping, but there's definitely a place for flipping, so I'm going to explain and break down the two of them for you. First off, in flipping and pitching, we like to have our bait out almost basically right to the top of the real seat right there. Right out there. And the benefit to this, okay, this is that less than 35 feet real silent deadly entry. It allows you to be much more accurate with your bait placement. The advantage to this is if I'm casting to a target that's only a few inches wide or I see there's a little hole right under the bottom of this tree, or I see the edge of the toolies and I know there's probably a bass in there, I could pitch directly into that target versus the roll cast if I was 50 or 60 feet back, I may have had trouble hitting that target. Or I may have thought it was a little bit too loud and I could have spooked that fish. So instead I came into about that 30 foot range and I made that perfect placement. It's the subtle changes that get you extra bites. It's the subtle changes from a pro, from a weekend angler, for the novice angler. And that is subtleties that you can, you can have by knowing these different casts are going to be a tremendous advantage. So all I'm doing is holding that bait in my hand. As I let go of the bait, I'm easing down with the rod as I let go. What that's gonna do, it's gonna start to build tension into my rod. As that bait swings down in a pendulum style, I'm basically gonna just lift up with my rod tip and it's gonna pull momentum out. So let me show you from behind my shoulder. So I'm gonna drop it down and I'm gonna ease it out. This is strictly, that's your pitch. You see how quiet that enters right there? That is your pitch. Very accurate, very subtle, much more natural at closer ranges with a quieter, more subtle, more stealthy entry, that's gonna get you more bites. Hang with us guys, we'll be right back. Are you into diving, surfing, or fishing? And have you checked out the Salt Life Thanks YouTube for channel now, yet? Let's get back From to awesome the show. surfing insight to scuba diving locations and in and offshore fishing, bundled up with all sorts of crazy cool footage, the Salt Life has you ocean lovers covered. So go check out their YouTube channel and tell them if sent you. Hey guys, did you know that Jurors Truly is now hosting Lucky Tackle Box's monthly pan fish instructionals? And aside from relentless fish catching, I'll be breaking down the rigging and the gear you need to get going along the way. And of course, a few extra tips to help you score more fish on the goodies included in your box. So remember, the tug is our drug. So go visit LuckyTackleBox.com and get signed up today. Oh, you heard they got weapons of big fish destruction? Well, you heard right. Biwa Fishing Performance is the newest company hit the U.S. market by storm. With some of the sickest swim baits around and non-cookie cutter style lures that you could ever get your hands on, it's time to show these fish something new. Visit BWA.com. Attention Northern California anglers, have you been to boat country in Escalon with one of the largest selections of welded aluminum fishing boats from North River, Hughescraft, and now Crestliner? Chances are they have the right boat for you. And did I mention they have a full service center to take care of all your repair or boating maintenance needs? If you're a boat owner or just looking to become one, you owe it to yourself to check these guys out. Visit BoatCountryUSA.com or stop on by. We'll see you there. Did you know that Beeline makes specialized lines for all your fishing needs? From the super strong, abrasive resistant CXX or the low stretch, super stealthy CX Premium. Or maybe you're looking for invisibility or super bite detection with Beeline's 100% fluorocarbon. No matter what your needs, Beeline's got it covered. To find out more, visit Beeline.com. Beeline, baby! Ever tried pulling a planer board next to your boat when trolling or fishing from a swift current bank? If not, you're missing out on one of the most phenomenal fish catching machines on the market today. With Yellowbird planer boards pulling your lines perpendicular to your boat, you can't help but catch more fish. Find out more by visiting www.yellowbirdproducts.com. Did you ever wish for an RC boat when you were a kid? And do you have a passion for fishing? Well, guess what? It's time to do them both at the same time. With RCFishingWorld.com's RC Fishing Pole, it's time to be a kid again. So visit www.rcfishingworld.com today. Now we also have the flip. Now if we're in, I, I like to say 15 feet is about the maximal for a flip. Some guys flip further. I really don't. Um, let's say for example, there's a little leaf out here. I pitch it out to there. I'm on my pitch. Now if I want to flip, I grab that line right here above the reel and I pull it out. What I like to do that measurement for is my arms almost fully extended and my baits almost equal to that exact same spot where we started to pitch. From here, it's the same thing. You drop it down, you ease your bait out, 
you put the line right back onto here. The benefit here is you can move down the bank, hit multiple targets at the same time. You can keep going. You never have to get back up on the reel. You don't have to reel until you hook that fish. Then he hits it, wham, you can hit him like that. That's your flip. I rarely ever flip. I'm more or less pitching the majority of the time. I find these faster reels nowadays, you know, you're almost as fast as the flip. But if you do take a guy that's flipping for six hours and you're pitching for six hours with those few extra reels, he's going to have more bait placement on key strike zones than you are. Therefore, that's going to lead to more fish. So you got to remember, that's a distinct advantage. One thing I want to keep in mind for you guys, and I'm going to step back over here. I want you to see this. When you're pitching, you want that trajectory of your bait to stay relatively low to the surface of the water. You don't want to pitch, have it go up and plop back down. And I want to show you something here. I'm going to pitch at you and I'm going to keep it real low to the dock right there. That's real low. That's never be, that's never higher than my dad who's filming right now. Never higher than his knees. It's extremely low. The advantage is when it's extremely low like that, these bass that are in a feeding mode are looking up. When a bass is looking up, he expects either a small bird or something that's being dropped in the water to come in fast and low. Uh, a big damsel, a big dragonfly is coming in fast and low. It's not coming in boop, straight down like a bomb. It's coming in low. Basically, it gives him first look instead of spooking him. And a lot of the time when you start pitching in the summertime in the spring, as it's coming to your target, literally, you're going to have bass bust through the surface and grab that plug even before it makes contact with the water. So your pitch and your flip trajectory needs to be extremely low to the water. So practice that. Watch in my video how I tilt a five gallon bucket sideways and you need to make it into the back of the bucket and not plop up on top of that bucket. And that is your flip and your pitch. So the next cast I want to talk about is your overhand cast. This is very common when like fishing crankbaits and trying to get your bait out there as far as you possibly can. But there's a thing to that overhand cast. A lot of the time, you'll have a very light bait. Clear, clear as day with a big overhand cast. Shoo, you got a heavy bait, you can whip it out there. There's a mistake that some guys make. If the bait's too heavy, they try to crack the whip on an overhand cast, which is wham, wham. Instead of building up a load lob cast, which I'm gonna go over more thoroughly, and I have a Strike King 3XD right here. It's something I had tied on over at Bullard's Bar. I'm gonna show you something. I have a lighter bait. Now this is my overhand cast for a crankbait. I like to go almost half the length of the rod right here. What this is gonna allow me to do, as I start to rotate, and I'm gonna show you, let me reel this back up to the tip. I'm going to put my rod basically right over to my side, turn my hips back, rotate and bring my rod and around and over the top, almost behind me behind my opposite foot, rotate and over, rotate and over, rotate and over. The reason why I'm rotating, what that's allowing my bait to do is start to put tension on my line. As I'm rotating, I'm developing momentum and tension. Just like that roll cast, I was developing that tension, that force, that centrifugal force that's loading that rod for me. If I have a bait and I just try to crack the whip on it like that, a lot of the time, I'm gonna get a backlash. It's not gonna be placed perfect. So I'm gonna go almost half the length right here. I'm gonna rotate and I'm gonna fire out there like that. That bait is extremely light. The benefit and the reason why I got long distance casts, if I tried to make a roll cast with that light bait on this rod, it wouldn't have gone half that distance. It was my rotation, the bait almost half the length of the rod behind my opposite foot as I rotate, once I get into that sideways position to where my chest is facing forward, then I bring it over my head. So it's a rotation until my chest face forward, then over my head. That's going to load your rod a lot better and allow you to get a lot more distance on that cast with the crankbait or whatever other bait you're choosing to throw overhead. Let's say you have a weightless Senko or something. If you just stand there straight and do this whipping overhand cast, you'll literally get maybe 75% of the casting distance you would of rotating, going to your opposite foot, chest forward, then over your head. That's gonna load it up a lot more. It's gonna make your rod feel like it has a heavier bait, 
to lob it out there. It's gonna take all the loose line out, and you're gonna get a whole lot more distance, therefore you're gonna equal more than likely more fish in the boat, because you're getting that bait further away, you're covering more water. So, another cast that you have to do, just like the crankbait, okay, you have a buzz bait right here, but a lot of the time you're trying to place that buzz bait in the correct position. You're trying to pinpoint a target with the buzz bait. You're trying to overthrow some tree limbs and bring it through there and clink, 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 bounce it off to get that bite. Yes, you can do the overhand cast, but a lot of the time with the buzz bait, it has a lot of resistance. As you start to cast, these blades, these spinners catch wind. And if you do a snap, if you have any snap to your cast whatsoever, basically it's loose line going tight real quick to where your buzz bait's gonna accelerate real fast, then the blades are gonna start turning, and then it's gonna find its happy medium speed flying through the air. That change of speed all of a sudden is gonna overrun your spool and you're gonna get a backlash. A lot of people don't have the perfect buzz bait rod, which would be like a moderate fast bending right in here. They have either a fast rod or a moderate rod, and they don't have the perfect buzz bait rod. So I'm gonna show you a trick to take care of that and make sure you don't get a backlash with your buzz bait. Just like your crankbait, leave it halfway out and as i start to do that same rotation overhand right here what i'm doing is loading it the blades will start spinning on my buzz bait therefore when i release my clutch and free my spool in that cast that buzz bait will already find its happy medium and you can do that same overhand rotate back opposite foot over and you'll hear the props i'm sure you heard that as I went to cast. That vump was starting behind me. So I'm gonna tell you, you'll immediately know what's going wrong when your buddy cast his buzz bait and he turns and right here you hear vump. Expect to hear when his spool locks up and his backlash catches. If I have out about this much, I can do a little roll cast, but I wanna start developing it sooner. I want to do a faster roll cast to where I get those props to start to spin. This also applies when you're casting a spinner bait into the wind. You either want to leave out longer line to where you start to get it moving so in case the wind decides to change the speed on you all of a sudden, you don't get caught up like that. Now the same thing happens when you're doing that cast to accelerate it. You can kind of do the same thing with the roll cast. You can kind of bring it back. I'll try not to hit the camera here. You could kind of bring it back and basically the only thing you want to do is accelerate your bait more. So it'll be a, right through there, accelerating the whole way into your cast. You don't want to do it like a little jig and flick it up there. Anytime you're flicking something with blades or props, you have a higher potential at backlash. Especially something with bigger props. I have a double bladed buzz bait right here. Uh, catches a lot of wind. So you want that crankbait style cast. You want it to load up. You want it to start to accelerate before ever taking your thumb off of that spool to free that bait up. If I have it short right here, like that, if I have it my standard four to six inch length, I am asking for trouble with the buzz bait because at that point I go to release, my bait is accelerating and slowing down right there at the same time I'm taking my thumb off of that spool, therefore leading to a backlash. So always leave a little bit of extra line out like that. Rotation back of the foot, off the front, and you'll hear that boom, just like that. Now, if you don't like that, you can do that exact same thing with the roll cast, but basically leave your line out a little bit longer. As I talked about with the roll cast, that four to six inches, leave out about a foot to 18 inches, and you'll hear that prop start to spin at that point as you're coming around. Don't leave it too long to where you're going to hit the ground and that'll allow you to be a little bit more accurate on your targets if you're trying to pinpoint targets a little bit better instead of covering a distance cast. Okay, here's another thing that guys are getting more and more into is big bait fishing. If you're a beginner, I don't really suggest fishing Huddlestons unless you're out with a guide or fishing big, heavy, 8-inch plus swim baits like this. But if you want to know how to throw them, and this is, this is funny, I see this happen all the time, of guys going to, all of a sudden, when they're gonna cast this, doing that crack the whip cast. They go from nothing to everything, right there. And when you have a bait that's almost a dang pound, I don't care how stout of a rod you have, it's gonna snap. So don't blame the rod manufacturer. Blame yourself for not knowing how to cast it. You cannot crack the whip on any heavy bait. You should never 
crack the whip on anything for that matter. It's, it's better to do the right cast, a roll cast, an overhand cast, a load cast, flip or pitch. Don't crack the whip on anything. If you're cracking the whip, you're asking for trouble. So another thing, with your big baits like this, it's basically a load cast and it's almost like the crankbait except you're not going overhead. It looks like a lot of guys are casting these big baits straight overhead, but realistically, we're coming off at that angle right there. We're coming off that angle. We're basically doing that same rotation, but we're coming off at that. It's almost like a baseball pitcher coming out like that. He's throwing it up, almost sidearm, not quite sidearm, not quite overhead, but right in between that happy medium. And it's gonna help load that rod. And I'm gonna show you. So when I'm throwing this big old swim bait, I'm gonna bring it here, and I'm not even gonna extend my arm. This is a big heavy bait. I'm just gonna bring it out and rotate it right from there. You know, that's almost 200 feet away, and that was a lob. I didn't need to snap it. I didn't need to go straight overhead. These are big heavy baits, and that, that throw came right at this angle. It wasn't straight overhead wasn't sidearm it was right in between and that's just strictly that same rotation leaning back just like i have a crankbait as my chest faced the target then i came up and i released at that point all right guys so now another cast i really want to talk to you guys about is that skip absolutely critical most guys get super intimidated by the skip. The reason for it is it leads to a ton of backlashes while you're learning. Yes, that can be extremely intimidating. It could cost you money online. Um, I say, you know, learn with 15 or 20 pound fluorocarbon. Let me teach you the mechanics of a skip. First off, when you look, bounce that one a little bit high. I want to show you the reason for a skip is you can get directly under trees. You can skip right in front of you. I'm skipping right at my toes right here. Most guys try to skip a little further out there like that. As you can see, that's going 40, 50 feet under targets. I could be casting at a tree 8 feet, 5 feet from me, directly in front of me. The branches could be laying on the water, but I could have a hole this big. And there could be timber. 25, 30 feet back under there. I could see bass sitting in there. I see that it's prime bass water. You need to be able to make that cast. Instead of saying, that's okay, I'll pitch to the outside. You need to be able to make that cast and you need to be able to make it often. So pitching is something you really need to learn how to do. And I know not a lot of guys do it because I go to really popular public waters and I'll see a tree and I'll see a bass right there. So comfortable up there sunning himself behind the tree because he knows no one's gonna throw to him. He's not intimidated, no one's walking around it. So you gotta learn how to pitch. You could pitch a lot of baits. You could pitch a worm, you could pitch them on a spinning rod, you could pitch them on a bait caster, but the bait casting way is the hard way to learn how to do it, but that's how you need to know. Uh, the most common, I like a 3 8 ounce jig or a half ounce jig uh, with a big chunky trailer on there, a flat piece of meat. You want some flat surface right there. You don't want to skip a football head jig. You want to skip like an archy head jig. Something with a big amount of flat surface area. Uh, get used to skipping jigs first. You could skip hollow belly frogs, the floating frogs. Those skip substantially well. I skip those a lot in the summer over matted grass. I don't want to throw a jig up into a bunch of snot, but I would like to skip a frog back under a tree up onto some slot mats and go yank a hog out of there. The mechanics are critical. One of the things I'm going to tell you right off the bat you can reel directly to the rod tip. I usually leave about an inch or two inches. Now, instead of making this huge cast, when you make a big cast, you're rotating. Your rod's rotating. If you're trying to skip a rock, you're trying to keep it exactly straight, to skip it, to plane it across that surface. The longer momentum you make, the more likely you are, you are to put rotation into that bait. So a short quick straight line just a short quick straight line and you want to be parallel with the water when you release it you want to be low and parallel with it you don't want a long cast you want a short sweet one short fast one and as you hit that water fast you're going to barely feather the spool 
as I'm casting and as it's hitting the water, my thumb is kind of just hovering on the spool. I'm not taking my thumb completely off. It's just loosely touching the line. It's something we call feathering the spool. I cast real fast. My thumb's barely on that spool. I'm feathering it as it's skipping. Therefore, kind of almost giving it a tight line on the spool, creating a little extra spool tension, which prevents that backlash. Get out to a swimming pool, get out to a local lake and try it. In golfing, there's a thing called throwing the box. And not that I'm a good golfer, I'm probably about one of the worst golfers out there. But when they say throwing the box, they Im you imagine holding this side of the box and this side of the box, and this is all ice right here. I wanna slide the box perfectly straight. I don't wanna slide the box into a curve. I wanna slide it to where the box slides 200 feet perfectly straight. So what it means is keep your hands perfectly in line with one another. Don't rotate. If you rotate during a skip, you're going to get more backlashes. If you rotate out, if you hook it or you slice it or whatever that term is, you're going to get a backlash. It's going to dig into the water. You need to throw that box. So imagine make, your skip's only going to be, my cast right there was maybe a foot and a half, two foot long. I wasn't winding up. I'm not doing a roll cast. You could basically start, stop just fast, zoom, like that. But it has to be perfectly straight. It has to be parallel with the water, and you have to feather that spool. Don't think that you can ease into it. I'm going to show you. I'll probably get a backlash because I'm going to have in my head what most of you are going to start with, that start slow mentality. Here we go. Woo, I got lucky right there. I didn't get a backlash. If you go to skip slow, you're 10 times likelier to get a backlash. you got to do it with speed. Try not to aim directly into the water. Try to just parallel it. Get low. Gravity's going to pull your jig down. As it's going parallel with that water and you throw, gravity's going to bring it down and it's going to start skipping for you. Don't think you need to aim at that water and that's going to help you out a ton. Well, hopefully those tips on casting helped you guys out. You need to have all those. If you're having trouble skipping, focus on the other ones and get to skipping later. Um, if you have that in your tackle box and you're able to pull out that skip, uh, versus the guys in front of you that can't do it, you're going to get to fish that they cannot. Uh, and visit informativefisherman.com. Hit me up on Facebook, Instagram. I'm doing Periscope now at Info Fisherman. Everything else is Informative Fisherman. We'll see you next time, guys. Thanks for watching.